Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining um, our webinar today on Beyond Value Chain Mitigation. Um, we're going to make a, a steady start while um, many people join the meeting. So thanks to, to all of you. Great to see so many uh, friends of, of Gold Standard and our partners and also a, a whole lot of new faces. So excited to discuss this topic with you today. And um, we are here having this webinar today because last week Gold Standard, uh, Milky Wire and Murmur, who you'll meet on this call, uh, launched a guidance for companies to implement um, beyond value chain mitigation action. And a couple of weeks before that, somebody else you'll hear from on this call, Science Based Targets, uh, released some really excellent papers on the same topic. And before that, in, in 2020, uh, WWF, our colleagues at WWF published a really interesting blueprint for corporate responsibility that included for this idea. And if you go even further back, um, checking our records um, back to even 2016 post Paris Agreement, we started talking about how we should maybe think about evolving the framing for responsibility for unabated emissions, even as far back as that. So really a culmination of lots of exciting work um, coming together. Today's webinar is a packed agenda. It's really, I would say, a game of four quarters in this case, uh, which is to say we have a first panel from colleagues at Science Based Targets and WWF to kind of set the scene, talk about the credibility principles, think about what um, robust, credible corporate responsibility is for unabated emissions. Um, and then we will share uh, myself and Robert Hergland of Milky Wire uh, a little more on what's in the gold standard Milky Wire Murmur guidance. So to take you through some of the rationale that went into drafting that document and what it actually says. Uh, and then we wanted to 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 step that up a little bit then and hear from real companies either already applying some of these ideas or about to take a step on that journey and hear about some of the successes, the challenges. So hopefully hoping for a, a lively conversation there, especially. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with some Q&A and we'll share some of the exciting things that are coming up in our BBCM programme. So just housekeeping wise, before we get into it, this webinar is being recorded. It will be published. We will share the um, slides, etc., via Gold Standards website and publications. So you'll get to see all of that. Um, there is also a question and answer function. Hopefully all of you as participants can see the Q&A functionality in Teams. We're going to manage Q&A through that function rather than have individuals put hands up because we have a huge number of registrants today, which is super exciting. So looking forward to some questions. For questions we can't get to today, we will do our very best to answer those in writing and publish that too, albeit we might try and group some of the similar questions together for efficiency. So with no further ado, I really want to get into it. Um, panel one, super excited to welcome to the call Scarlett Benson of uh, Science Based Targets, who recently led on the BBCM publications released a couple of weeks ago, and Leah Fink, Senior Manager of Climate Business at WWF, to hear a little more of the civil society um, viewpoint on how this might unfold from here. So, Scarlett, um, over to you, really. Do give me a nod when you want to move on a uh, slide. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to give you a short presentation on beyond value chain mitigation. Uh, Owen, if you go to the next slide. Um, so, very briefly, for those of you who don't know, the Science Based Targets Initiative is a voluntary initiative um, where we provide methodologies for companies to set climate targets in line with uh, 1.5 degrees. And in 2021, we published the Corporate Net Zero Standard, um, which sets out the kind of actions that companies would take to get to a, a get to net zero. And one of the recommendations in the Corporate Net Zero Standard is on beyond value chain mitigation. Um, and the recommendation is formulated, as you can see on this slide. So we recommend that companies take action or make investments outside their own value chains to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions in addition to their near term and long term science based targets. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so, yeah, we pub. Beyond value chain uh, mitigation was a term we introduced in 2021 and um, just in February, a couple of weeks ago, um, almost exactly a month ago today, we published these two reports. 
um, the above and beyond report on the left, um, which the, the target audience is really companies. So it sets out um, recommendations for companies as they work to design and implement high integrity and high impact BVCM strategies. And then the second report, Raising the Bar, um, is um, has a slightly different audience. It's really for the climate accountability ecosystem, and it provides um, information on the research that we conducted on the barriers and incentives um, to corporate adoption of BBCM. And it proposes a set of recommendations for a range of actors, including standard setters, um, advocacy organisations, research and academia, policymakers, etc., on what they and we as an ecosystem can do to kind of create a more of a global norm around beyond value chain mitigation. Next slide. So in the above and beyond report, we re-articulate the definition of BVCM that was set out in the corporate net zero standard. So the, the definition is the same uh, and it is defined as mitigation action or investment that falls outside of a company's value chain, including activities that avoid or reduce emissions or remove and store greenhouse gas emissions. So um, it is beyond a company's scope one, two and three emissions um, and it is emissions reductions or removals or and or removals. Next slide. The purpose of BBCM, so we define the purpose as a two, twofold really. So the first is for companies to accelerate the global net zero transition by helping other economic and social actors to reduce and or remove emissions. And it's also a mechanism that allows companies to take responsibility for their unabated emissions that are continuing to be released as they progress towards the delivery of their science based targets. And we'll hear more in particular about this sort of responsibility aspect later. Next slide. So really important to underscore that BVCM must not replace or delay action that a company takes to reduce their scope one, two and three emissions in line with the 1.5 degree pathway. And this is really aligned with the IPCC, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, um, which states that unless there are immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees will be will be beyond reach. And that options are available in every sector that can at least halve emissions by 2030. So in essence, beyond value chain mitigation is about going beyond what you need to do to transition your own business to also accelerate uh, mitigation across uh, the wider economy. Next slide. So we define a set of goals and principles um, for companies. And so these can be used when they're thinking about how to develop their strategies. The goals are twofold. So the first is to deliver additional near-term mitigation outcomes to achieve the peaking of global emissions in the mid-20s and a halving of global emissions by 2030. The second goal is to drive additional finance into the scale-up of nascent climate solutions and enabling activities to unlock the systemic transformation needed to achieve net zero by mid-century. So the first goal is really focused on the near-term. Uh, and it places a heavy emphasis on, um, you know, realised ex post mitigation outcomes, whereas the second goal is more about uh, deploying finance towards a wider set of activities um, in, for longer term transformation. The BBCM principles, there are four of them. So scale, financing need, co-benefits and climate justice. Um, and these can be used by companies to when they're thinking about a portfolio of investments and where they should be deploying finance. Um, and within the report, we provide a list of BVCM um, principle aligned mitigation opportunities. So we describe the sorts of things which are really in need of climate finance and that, you know, um, touch on all of these principles that we think are really no regrets actions for companies as they're working out, you know, wh where is it best for them to um, provide finance. Next slide. So we have a four step process um, that we've set out for companies to design and implement high impact and high integrity BVCM. I won't go through it in detail because no, we're not we're, we're fairly short on time. But the first step is to set and work to deliver a net zero target. Um, and this is clearly aligned um, with what I mentioned earlier, that BVCM mustn't delay or replace act action by a company to mitigate emissions in its own value chain. So we want companies to, you know, 
develop their inventory, set a science based target, a net zero target and uh, an associated transition plan and to be working towards achieving that. The second step is around establishing a pledge. So, you know, what is the commitment that you're going to make over what period? What's the size of that commitment? The third step is to take action. And this is really where we lean on those goals and principles that I just described um, in terms of sort of identifying where companies are going to provide finance and the quality standards and the sort of social and environmental guardrails to ensure that they are high integrity. And then the final step is to report BBCM activities and outcomes. So we provide recommendations around developing an MRV framework, kind of reporting uh, recommendations as well as recommendations on, on claims. And throughout these steps, we provide linkages to other resources that um, we think are worth taking a look at um, as companies develop these strategies. Next slide. So I think this is my final slide and um, maybe just to kind of end on the business case, um, you know, we the, the above and beyond report really focuses on, you know, what actions we think companies should take um, and what we think best practice looks like. But we we ultimately, you know, we really acknowledge that the ability to secure internal resources to make that business case internally to um, but for BBCM depends on the company's business case. And that business case is going to look different, well, depending on the sector, depending on the, the market that the company's in, um, the location of the company, and ultimately the extent to which it's impacted by different climate, physical and transition risks and opportunities. And so throughout the report, we um, we provide illustrative case studies of um, how different companies in a range of sectors are kind of implementing the guidance and they are illustrative to be clear, uh, how these companies could implement the guidance and, and how that relates to their business case. So um, really looking forward to hearing from the companies later on the panel. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for having me and looking forward to the Q&A as well. Thanks so much, Scarlett, and congrats for the, the publications. We really appreciated reading those, and thanks for, for sharing that vision. And to, to build on that, really, um, uh, we referenced earlier that um, our colleagues at WWF back in, I think it was 2020, released what, what I would consider a landmark publication, which was the blueprint for um, climate and nature for companies. And the reason I say that's a landmark is one of the things you hear a lot in our in our work and in our space is that um, if you know if NGOs would stop criticizing things, maybe we could get on with solving these problems. And, and actually, one of the things that that blueprint did in a really interesting, exciting way was to set out a positive vision of what companies should do um, rather than only what they shouldn't do. And in, in some way, you know, all of this BVCM work and all of the value chain abatement work is um, is is indebted to that kind of thinking that we we sort of shift in mindset. Now, that doesn't mean what we should do is easy, um, but you know, setting out the positive vision uh, as well as you know dealing with some of the negative criticism is an important step. And so, really excited to welcome to the call um, Leah Fink from WWF. Um, Leah, it would be great to hear a little bit about where WWF is in, in thinking about BBCM and its application and some of the work you've got going on and, and what you're planning to do next over at WWF. Thank you so much, Owen. Happy to be here and, and happy to provide that perspective from WWF and specifically how we're working in, in WWF Germany and in the Dach region, uh, providing quite specific guidance, but of course aligned with um, our global understanding, exactly as you already nicely laid out, Owen, um, on, on providing what can be proactively done already. Um, so, what we are trying to do, of course, <laughs> with all of this, um, specifically with our with our corporate partners and providing guidance to the market, is to really move away from the still widely used compensation and offsetting logic um, to a systemic view of of what is the role of a corporate in the world, right? So this, of course, um, involves a translation exercise. Um, defining what a robust climate strategy looks like for a company in 2024 and uh, every year following. And um, of course, that includes measuring and disclosing emissions, having validated near and long term science based targets, and very importantly, alongside impactful advocacy efforts, 
lastly, but not least, taking responsibility for the unabated emissions by adequately pricing them and contributing to the societal transition to net zero, as we just heard, which is now called beyond value chain mitigation. And in this space, as, as I'm sure many today in this call and this, this ecosystem know, there is still a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, um, yeah, chaos let's let's put it like this also in terms of terminologies and guidance and what to do so of course there's a huge need to support companies along that way and um yeah just really support them in navigating this prevailing uncertainty with well, ever-changing stakeholder expectations of course now also um the regulatory landscape changing significantly all over the world and generally increased scrutiny which we of course welcome on one hand on the other hand we also don't want to um be that a barrier to actual um channeling channeling climate finance to where we need it most um so this is of course this field um or that we're that we're all navigating at the moment so um yeah we of course think it's very important uh, to define um what's or to to try to answer what is the right thing to do what's the right thing to do now um in terms of uh, bbcm strategies so well, we just heard from Scarlett's great overview that the SBTI now with the report has really provided a great overview, a common ground, right? What are we even talking about? What are the elements that need to be looked at and so on? And since we don't have much time to to close this huge investment gap that we all know exists, um, now it's really the time to put that into practice. So, of course, we very much welcome that Gold Standard Milky Way now building on that and a lot of other actors building on that too, providing much needed implementation guidance. And we at WWF, we also try to, um, to do that by working with companies to build and implement robust BVCM strategies. And specifically at WWF Germany in 2022, we've launched guidance. It's currently still in German, but will be translated and so it like basically internationalized um, soon, which uh, which basically sets a best practice standard, um, the so-called contribution model, um, also closely aligned and building, of course, um, on the SPTI uh, work. And well, now as we're short on time, and we're not go into detail of the of the model, and I mean it involves a lot of the elements that have been talked about, and well, mostly will be talked about in the rest of the webinar today. So I'll just really quickly go through the main elements. So, um, what's the strategic aim? Um, what do we want to achieve with BBCM? Right. This is a question that every company should ask itself. And following the contribution model, the answer needs to be to move away from the company footprint as the main reference. Also, in terms of why we're doing this, so, um, as in um moving as said to a more systemic view to contributing to global climate protection right so rather aiming at climate stewardship rather than climate neutrality um the what's also really important is the moral assumption of of the bbcm approach and here the contribution model follows the polluter pays um principle which which basically means the company is taking responsibility for their emissions, right? That have historically been generated or which they continue to emit. The next question, of course, how do we calculate the budget? Um, here, the contribution model um, calls for the, the money for ton method. Um, so really moving away from the singular view of CO2 being the only metric to be to CO2 being one of uh, many metrics also of course taking into account and really highlighting co-benefits as well of um of well different projects and work to be financed so a company ideally basically takes all their emissions go one two and three right and prices them directly with the current damage cost price per ton of CO2 equivalents 
And then the next question is how to spend the budget. Scarlett already um, touched on that. And in the contribution model, the budget calculated um, in this way flows into a varied portfolio of climate protection and Generally, the role of portfolios is huge in this um, in this transition. So we also really recommend to start looking at that on the way, right? Even if you might, as a company, might not ready yet to implement everything the way that it would be ideal. But really moving away from this singular reliance on carb for, um, on carbon credits to a varied portfolio, uh, take into account the core principles um, that Scarlett has also just mentioned, right? Scale, financing need, co-benefits, climate justice, and really looking at basically the high hanging fruits what are the projects that that have the highest potential but also that are that are probably really difficult to fund and this also shows that we that we um or this is another reason why we need to move away from only relying on carbon credits because they can simply with their metric system the the, the kpis that they are built on um not fully or not basically cover all of the projects that are worth funding for. So what we are working with companies that basically to have a portfolio of credits and other projects with co-benefits for people in nature and just programs of technical and commercial innovation and also advocacy and so on. And lastly, making a robust claim on that based on validated science-based targets and basically not mentioning netting out emissions and so on <laughs> um, to to really provide the strategic clarity and um, that should really allow decoupling this offset claims and logic and emphasizing the mitigation hierarchy and we do really hope that all of these building blocks and all of these guidances in the landscape are coming together to re-enable a race to the top um, to effectively contribute to to achieving a global state of net zero. And I'm really looking forward to to hearing um, the corporate voices and the rest of the webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Leah. Really, um, really helpful, I think, to hear from civil society leaders on the direction of travel and um, building on that um, and really reflecting the work um, put into both SPTI and WWF's effort. And, and I would also you know, love to recognize the work that's been done over at New Climate Institute as well, who should be recognized as a real pioneer in this space. Um, Gold Standard, Milky Wire, and Murmur all um, had, um, uh, you know, all co-authored the guidance that we released last week. And so, I'm really pleased to introduce to the call uh, my colleague Robert Hergland um, at Climate, uh, sorry, at Milky Wire. Um, he and I really, you know, work very closely on this, and we'll share a presentation now um, that. Um, we we will walk you through both the rationale and uh, the content of the guidance. So um, starting just um, from my side first, I'll try and frame a little bit around how we see it from a technical logic perspective. And one of the things that we do at Gold Standard, especially when we think about how to create mechanisms and claims, is to try to start with a reflection of the scope and acts of responsibility. So what we see a lot in the space is uh, and you see it in other spaces as well, like biodiversity crediting, is we almost start with the market instrument and then we try and define the action and the responsibility to make sure the market instrument flies. Actually, that's backwards. Um, what we should be doing is saying companies, organizations should be responsible for X. To deliver X, they need to do Y things. And to do Y things, they're going to need Z tools. And that's really the logic of the guidance. And so in this case, the scope of responsibility, as Leah laid out, is organizations um, harmful emissions ongoing and the act of responsibility is actually in two parts so as Scarlett shared the first part is to abate value chain emissions in line with science that's your scope one two and three target and then to act in a responsible way concerning the unabated emissions so on the harmful things that are still happening while harm is being reduced and really speaking then the logic of which mechanism you can use for that should not be as fraught or as ideological as some of the discourse conveys. It should be a case of if the mechanism can deliver efficiently and practical, practically the act, then it's a good mechanism for the purpose. And that's really how we tried to come about this. There is a fourth element at the bottom there, which is just to say, 
the mechanism shouldn't screw up anything else. We don't want to trip up the Paris Agreement, for example. We don't want to trip up efforts under science-based targets for scope one, two, and three. So really, yes, we want it to work on its own merits, but we don't play in bubbles. We also have to think about how it works for everything else. And last year, Gold Standard released a summary of its own viewpoint, uh, a technical policy document, you could call it, on what are the key elements, the key principles for organizational responsibility. And we came up with five good governance, value chain emissions abatement, the one we're talking about today, responsibility for unabated emissions, and then climate related practices refers to things like packaging, uh, deforestation, and then the fifth is to make credible measured claims about that. And for principle three, uh, like SBTI, not a coincidence, we have these four steps worded slightly differently, but effectively amounting to the same thing, which is to account and report for the unabated emissions, so your footprint, use that to set a carbon fee per ton. So again, advocating for that money for ton model or some variant of it, and then use that money to fund high quality climate action before going on to make credible claims. And partly, you know, the reason for this shift, if you want to look at it from a, is the mechanism suitable for the act purpose, partly the shift to contribution from offset would be because it doesn't necessarily enact the responsibility in quite the right way, but also it's a source of criticism. It's a source of impracticality, because if you want to say you've compensated for something, that implies a lot of quality attributes and quality measures that are needed to make that claim true. Whereas contribution actually is a little more flexible, allows us to include for other things, allows us to be a bit more realistic in terms of what mechanisms can actually deliver. And so when we think about mechanisms, last slide from me before I pass to Robert, is just to say that we tried in the guidance to think about what are the quality attributes needed to enact the responsibility. And those came in three buckets, the relationship attribute. So how does this action relate to your value chain? Is it inside, nearby or outside? In this case, it needs to be outside. Accounting and reporting attributes. So that's things like data quality, which methods you should use, how to address double counting. And there are a lot of the norms of the carbon markets are very useful. So look at what we do in our carbon crediting mechanisms. Think about the qualities, the core carbon principles of ICBCM. Um, and then you have um, action attributes, which are more like uh, which activities to support. Should they be additional? Should they be permanent, etc. And generally, again, there are a lot of the attributes of carbon markets are helpful but they don't necessarily apply in the same way if you were to example, for example, fund enabling action, research and development. And Robert will say a bit about that in a minute. So um, Rob, if I may pass over to you to, to see us out on this section. Just let me know when you want to sh switch sides. Great, thank you so much, Owen. Uh, thanks to everyone joining. So Robert Hergland from Milky Wire. Uh, Milky Wire is an impact platform that helps companies uh, solve environmental problems to take responsibility for uh, their work and help reach their sustainability targets. And this is something we've been working on for a long time. This particular guide for during the last year together with um, a lot of other work in, in the area. And this guidance is looking into uh, a, a, how to, to do it, give a best practice recommendations for how we can fund climate action um, in the way that maximizes the impact. But it's also important to say that this is voluntary and getting companies to support climate action outside their value chains, it's nothing you can force. So we should also celebrate uh, anything that companies do that is positive and that is not where the claims are honest uh, and you're not giving, shining, um, trying to give uh, an impression of something else. So all action to fund climate action is good and we should try to encourage this as much as possible and make it the default assumption that all companies should be expected to contribute something to help uh, also advance climate outside their value chain. But in this guide, we try to give some more detailed guidance on if you really want to maximize uh, your climate impact, how could you go about it? Uh, and there's a lot of different things you can fund, but we give some guidance on what to look for when you are assessing projects. So before you fund it, looking at a detailed intervention plan, looking at baseline estimation, what's the probability of success for, for a project if it hasn't happened yet? What it's both the direct and the indirect effect that could happen, the additionality of the project, but also attribution analysis, both for the project in solving a particular problem 
but also your funding. So if you're funding a new advocacy project, like maybe you have a small part of it, or maybe you're funding the whole thing. And this hopefully gives you some kind of rough number of what the expected impact of this intervention is. And then you can also do a cost effectiveness analysis, comparing different types of climate projects, seeing which one has the highest expected impact. Um, and of course, looking at social and then ecological risks and seeing that this is a sustainable thing in, in other regards. Next slide. And it's helpful to look at different aspects of, of climate products in, in time and also uh, in the way that they are creating this impact. We can talk about direct and indirect impact, and we can talk about future and near term. And as you can see on this graph, there are many different interventions that are on different places in this axis. So if you talk about financing renewable energy, uh, protecting forests directly, switching fuel, um, scaling up uh, established carbon removal like Bioshar, that's something that happens now. Uh, it's direct, you know what you're doing, it's near term. It's high certainty and high measurability, but some products have problem with additionality in this uh, in this sort of quadrant, as we've seen with renewable energy projects. And all quadrants have their sort of issues. If you look at um, uh, long-term future impact, indirect impact, you have things like financing R&D, which can be very, very important. Financing advocacy and policy projects to phase out coal, for example, and, and push decision makers to change the way they lend money to, to new projects and supporting new uh, nascent carbon removal. And here it can be quite difficult to know if it's gonna work or not, but the expected impact can be still quite high uh, and it can be hard to measure, but you can have really, really impactful and strong projects in this quadrant. And then you have the near-term indirect impacts, like super important enablers, charging infrastructure, um, public transportation, changing habits on uh, how people eat, to eat less meat, etc., uh, avoiding the root causes of deforestation. Also harder to measure, super important. And future direct impact could be things like planting trees, where uh, growing trees, where you uh, know what's going to happen. It's You can measure it, but it's quite far in the, in the future. So um, all of these types of products are worthy of uh, support, but different companies might choose different quadrants depending on sort of your risk appetite and their portfolios and funds that might have a mix of them. Go ahead, next one. And we, in the guide we say we're making a special case for the global issues that are not easily supported through other mechanisms. And protecting forests is one of those. There's no natural way that people uh, start paying for protecting forests to avoid deforestation and as well as community services and novel kind of still expensive carbon removal doesn't really have many other reasons for it to be deployed other than the climate benefit companies needed to reach their net zero targets um, in the future and so that's a use case but in contrast to for example renewable energy electric vehicles there are no other natural customers so all companies sort of going to need this to some extent and you are the only natural customers you have to start financing it and so there, there is a strong case of, of including this in beyond value chain mitigation together with other types of interventions next slide please and then when impact is funded ideally you do an impact assessment we go into the in the guide as well looking at the updated baseline the description of what has happened try to quantify both direct impact that is directly measurable but also the indirect impacts making assumptions and, and trying to make that estimate and then an, an attribution analysis and this is especially important well for reporting and sort of talking about what's happened but also for funding again like was this a good strategy were we successful are these the type of products that we want to refund but it's also important to say that just because something wasn't successful doesn't mean it was a bad decision to support it it might have been the right decision to support an advocacy project too that could have been extremely impactful but it was like a 50 50 it was going to work then it might still have been the, very much the right decision. And that sort of shows why beyond value chain mitigation is, is a broader tent that also allows for those, those type of actions when you're not making neutrality claims, compensation claims, instead focusing on the long-term impact. Next slide. And then there are different ways this can happen and different mechanisms that you can fund projects. 
traditionally carbon credits have been i think maybe the main way that uh, companies have been trying to to finance climate projects and it's still like a possible route um, but there are also other things like grants to NGOs or um, making, giving support to, to carbon removal through uh, pre-purchases that haven't happened yet and it's not yet a carbon credit, for example. Uh, and different things would enable different types of claims. When you're going to reach your net zero target and neutralize your last emissions, you need permanent carbon removal for fossil fuels and possibly temporarily carbon removal for other greenhouse gas emissions emissions under the like for like principle. Um, but contribution claims is wider where you can also talk about your indirect impact, um, advocacy, uh, R&D, et cetera. And um, yeah, so this this kind of gives the, the whole picture. It's not complete. There are other combinations that we're not able to show here, but it gives, gives an idea of how the mechanism claims and outcomes uh, stick together. Uh, and uh, next slide. An example of this is the Climate Transformation Fund that I manage for the for Milky Wire. We've been doing beyond value chain mitigation explicitly since 2021, uh, trying to create this vehicle for companies to take responsibility for their emissions without compensating and just trying to help reach global climate targets and maximize the, the, the effect. And the fund supports nature restoration and protection, uh, mostly with grants, decarbonization like advocacy and policy, but also renewable energy, and then permanent carbon removal, nascent solutions that are still maybe in the lab, we're getting them tested out, catalytic funding to help build the sector so that carbon removal is available to reach net zero target. And we have funders like Klarna, Spotify, ING Bank, many of them uh, implementing an internal carbon fee um, to, uh, to, to generate a budget, but also using other mechanisms. Okay, we can go to the next one. And this topic of setting an internal carbon fee to, to generate your beyond value chain mitigation budget is there's a sound logic behind it because you're still having an impact with your emissions. So taking responsibility for it uh, implies that you, 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 you need to pay for the, the damages that are done and optimally paying the social cost of carbon, which essentially says this is what what the damages are um, would be one approach to, to doing it and then you could say that you're taking the full responsibility for your emissions that's in the, in the range of 100 to 250 dollars uh, you could also look at the cost of permanent carbon removal uh, to permanently remove all of it which is in the same range but we also acknowledge that different companies have different capabilities here so a differentiated approach where profit comes in and, and sort of where you are as a company uh, is, is also weighted in so next slide um, this is analysis that uh, done with uh, by Carbon Gap, which I also uh, was part of, showing the profit per ton uh, and the CO2 intensity of companies. So in the bottom here, you see kind of mining, uh, electricity companies, oil companies, seeing that they have profits per ton under $100 uh, um, and sometimes under $10. So it's a, it's difficult to to pay the social cost of carbon. Whereas in the yellow group in the top, the profits per ton over over ten thousand dollars per ton over a hundred thousand dollars for some and there's a low co2 intensity so they have the possibility to pay the full cost of their emissions and taking the full responsibility and on the next slide we have some uh, recommendations that come from uh, that's in the guide uh, but this slide in particular comes from a white paper that milky way published with uh, very similar recommendations earlier saying that those that have the possibility to fund uh, to pay the social cost of carbon, this kind of high cost uh, should do it. Uh, companies that have very low carbon intensity or very high profits per ton could implement the high fee in all their scopes, whereas others um, might need to have a, a lower fee for perhaps scope free. Um, and then those that have higher emissions might might not be the best thing to select an internal carbon fee. Instead, you could opt for this money for ton approach that the SBTI is talking about as well. Choose a share of profit, for example, 1% and put that into climate projects. It's also important to recognize that many of these higher emitters have larger needs internally. So they might have massive internal needs to fund their decarbonization, maybe many times their profits. Um, so of course, there, there is a little bit more limit to what they can spend externally, but something everyone should be spending. All right, and the next slide shows some examples of companies that we are working with with Milky Wire supporting the fund. 
Klarna, um, Scope 1 and 2 in business travel, $100 per ton, $10 for rest. Mentimeter, $100 across the whole, uh, all three scopes. And then Northern Atomico, like, uh, like Klarna. All right. I think I, I, we're on, back on time now. Super. I Thanks, Rob. Fast, yeah, but, really. Uh, speed through. No, perfect. Thank you very much. And I think we have set the scene really nicely in terms of the the theory and potential practice. And so what we wanted to do next really was have a discussion amongst those that actually in some way have to do what Robert just said, you know, something, you know, take take responsibility for these elevated emissions. And so delighted to welcome um, um, some excellent uh, company representatives to discuss that. And, and Rob, I'll pass back to you to moderate on this section. You're on mute, Rob. Rob, you're on mute. Thank you. Let's just uh, try to get the panelists in the room while I uh, I present them. And uh, so here we have yeah strong panel five companies: Hannah Gran, uh, Climate Action Manager, Spotify, uh, Stephen Rosenzweig at General Mills, Agricultural Science Lead, and Salah Said, at the head of sustainability at Klarna, uh, Jacob Pogo, uh, head of carbon strategies uh, and innovation at Volkswagen Climate Partner. And then uh, Ian Stanton, head of sustainability, beggars group. And um, let's see, we'll, we have to, we're going to continue to have high speed here uh, to uh, make sure everyone has the time to talk. So, do we have Hannah in the room? I know you have to go quite soon, so we wanted to start with you. I don't think so. Then we'll start with Ian and see if the organizers of the meeting can see if they can find Hannah and promote her to, to speaker. But we'll, we'll start with Ian Stanton at uh, Beggars Group, a um, record company. You started something extremely exciting together with other partners, a whole new organization, um, Murmur, a way for the arts industry to take the climate responsibility. And you've been working with us to create this, uh, this climate guide as well. So uh, can you tell us a bit more about that and yeah, what's happening? Yes, although I did just see Hannah's raised her hand um, and if you said she has to go soon, I didn't know if you want to hand over to Hannah or not. Let's see if we can get her promoted and you can start, you can do your uh, initial and we'll, we'll see if we do follow up questions for, for you later. OK, yeah, so if you want me to talk a little bit about, um, um, oh, um, about um, Murma, yeah. So Beggars Group is a, a, a large group of independent record labels. Um, so we sit sort of firmly in the creative sector um, and we have potential to sort of have huge cultural impacts um, as well as having to decarbonize our own industries. So um, we made the decision to kind of not use carbon offsets in our sustainability strategy a few years back. Uh, we knew there was a much more impactful way to spend our money. Um, we wanted to ensure that funds could go into collaborative efforts that would, to decarbonize our wider value chain, but as well as really being able to leverage that kind of cultural impact, because one of the biggest opportunities in the cultural sector is that ability to influence social attitudes. Culture arguably sets the landscape for um, political action. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, we wanted to set this um, channel our funding into initiatives that would sort of go to uh, towards collaborative efforts to decarbonize our wider value chain but as well as really leveraging that impact the challenge was that that funding mechanism didn't really exist so we set up murmur um, so murmur has got is a strategic climate fund for the wider creative sector that has bvcm thinking at its heart um, and um, and it gives companies that are committed to ambitious climate um, carbon reduction one and a half degree aligned pathways um, to use an internal carbon price to calculate their donation into Murma. And then that contribution then gets spent in one of three ways, either changing the industry, collaborative ish, um, approach taken to supporting sustainable startups, seed funding, subsidising initiatives, etc. Um, changing the conversation. This is where we sort of look at training artists um, to competently and confidently talk and advocate um, 
on behalf of the climate crisis and amplify and, and elevate their messaging and then a, a fund that uh, we refer to as change the world which is then that kind of supporting those really highly impactful projects um, and organizations that got that real ability to make a difference um, and we kind of see that as a very high level kind of a theory of change really of why murmur exists and and um, yet to change the world we need to change the conversation we need to enable society to change the conversation and support our artists to do that and to do that we need to change the industry so we very much sit at the intersection of that wider value chain mitigation and beyond um, and and what murmur does it enables a, a much greater scale of impact um, of funding as if, if funding was direct from the individual partners um, and although our partners do use their unabated emissions to calculate the contribution into murmur um, it, they can't make any neutralization claims about, uh, on the basis of that and i think the whole concept of the sort of bringing forward the contribution claims um, through this guidance is, is really useful because um, it helps all of our um, partner organizations move away from that kind of binary approach uh, that was potentially offered there by sort of offsetting which was the only opportunity that was left to the sector before and moving to a much more robust measure um, and we very much sit in that future indirect impact set quadrant of the chart that you just showed Robert so um, um, and although our potential impacts can be very high it can be very hard to measure and I think the guidance for BVCM has been really helpful to help us shape where we can put our thinking in those sort of contribution claims um, but yeah Murmurs only launched publicly last week uh, it's been in a pre-launch pilot phase uh, for about the last two years where we've done some real thinking about how we can most effectively build the ecosystems to change and really channel the funds into that uh, beyond our value chains to maximize our impact um, but at launch we've got over a million pounds in pledged funds um, so that's come from various leading record labels and art galleries as well across the wider creative sector to help us do that great that's super exciting uh, such a great initiative and Hannah, uh, now we have got you with us. Uh, Spotify is one of the supporters of the Climate Transformation Fund, but also a lot of other climate initiatives. I wanted to know why is it important for Spotify to also fund climate action beyond your value chain? Yeah, I would say, I mean, we are early on our journey really in terms of this and, and kind of it's ever evolving really the approach to this. But I would say for, for us, it felt like it the system didn't really work. Um, that that was the old way to do things. So what we felt more and more was given that we are a very innovative company and we like to kind of challenge uh, things that doesn't work, uh, then it felt like the perfect fit really in terms of the approach that the fund has and, and also that we can support really today the solutions for tomorrow because we don't know um, exactly today what we need. So having a very broad approach to what we fund and what we support felt like the right thing to do. And also given that we we don't own that much physical uh, places or assets and so on, given that we don't have data centers or anything like that, it felt even more important that, to your point as well, when you showed the different graphs, that if we can support in other ways than through our, our own operations, given that we have rather limited impact, that is something that we wanted to, to support as well. And, and as I said, we really like the approach as well, because there are different alternatives out there that may put too much emphasis on just one solution, such as only the technical or only the nature based. But this approach felt perfect to us and also that we could support the advocacy part as well, which we all see, of course, that if the system doesn't change, it's very difficult for individual companies or individual people to, to take action. So, yeah, that, that's why we chose to, to do this approach. Mm, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, that's that's great to hear. Uh, and th there's a lot of going on, and and the the companies represented here, uh, Stephen at General Mills, you, you're doing a, a lot of exciting things as well on on beyond valuation mitigation. You want to start telling us a bit about that, and then I have a follow up question as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so for some quick context, you know, we set a science based target that covers scope three that includes scope three back in 2015 um, and our agricultural value chain is our largest source of scope three emissions we also have a regenerative agriculture ambition which we see as being able to improve a wider range of outcomes like biodiversity water and farmer economic resilience in addition to being an important climate lever um, and we prioritize this supply shed or sourcing region approach where we're working to improve these outcomes across the regions that we source ingredients. And so particularly for really dynamic commodity supply chains like wheat, that supply shed and sourcing region approach is critical. 
and you know climate and the interrelated water nature and human issues in the ag sector are really community and landscape level issues that require collaboration to address and for many of the agricultural ingredients we buy acting only within the value chain is just it's not enough and so our value chain is really just one small component of those agricultural landscapes and communities so operating at this landscape and community level rather than only focusing on the one crop that we might buy from a place helps us more systemically address barriers to widespread regenerative ag adoption and support initiatives that are necessary for improving landscape level outcomes like water quality and biodiversity which is ultimately what we need for broader resilience of this of the food supply which is our business case so i don't necessarily see this collaborative work at the landscape level being above and beyond value chain abatement i, I see it as an essential component for value chain abatement in the ag sector but the challenge that we face is that this collaborative or landscape level work is not well suited for being claimed as value chain abatement and this is something we explore in a in more detail in a white recent white paper with sustain cert um, which i'd encourage folks to check out but for many reasons a lot of what we're supporting which are these collective capacity building and locally led initiatives are not suitable for attribution of carbon impacts to individual companies even though these activities are needed for decarbonization of all value chains in those landscapes so I'd argue that this approach is not beyond value chain. It's a more systemic way of addressing value chain emissions. And this kind of work needs to be recognized. Um, there needs to be incentives for it. And BBCM might provide that kind of framework needed to do that. But I do worry that with the existing framing of BBCM, you know, all of this work could be characterized as beyond value chain and support. Did we lose Stephen? Yeah, I think we Seems did. Like it. It's unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, we'll get back to Stephen. Those are some very interesting insights there, and also challenging a bit the the framework. Now you're back, Stephen. And oh, so okay. that we 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 lost the thing last uh, part you said there. Uh, I think you froze. But those are super interesting and uh, challenging with the BBCM approach uh, and sort of going beyond and, and being collaborative but still also very much tied to your value chain and, and that, that's really important and how are you communicating this kind of more collaborative approach and how are you addressing that and what, what's the incentives to do so yeah hopefully I'm back I mean essentially what I was saying is there's a lot of important work that kind of falls in this gray area between value chain abatement and BBCM um, and, you know, in communicating in, you know, communicating this, it's really been helpful to, in addition to our science based target to have a regenerative agriculture ambition that is rooted in supporting broader impacts for nature and people at the landscape level. You know, we talk about a lot of our work in that context, and it's enabled us to support a wider range of efforts that we feel like is maximizing our impact without needing attribution of climate impact from every project necessarily. So we do have, you know, projects and value chains that are more suited for attribution of impact. So we will continue to parallel path those. And but, I, you know, ultimately, ideally, like since we have a foundation of monitoring and reporting our emissions inventory at the supply shed scale, I'm hopeful that our collective efforts with others will show up in bringing down the average emissions at this larger scale, which is ultimately what we need to happen, you know, to address climate change anyway way but i don't really know how we align the incentives for companies to support holistic coordinated action at the landscape level that's one of the biggest challenges i think today that we need to address you know companies are largely incentivized to do things that get them attributable credit towards their science-based targets yeah. and because of the nature of these complex overlapping commodity supply chains this need for carbon attribution has led to duplication and competition in efforts to reach farmers and essential but non-claimable work going unfunded and it's also mm. leading to carbon tunnel vision when we need to be solving for a broader set of challenges in the ag sector related to water, nature, and people. So lastly, the two relevant things I think that we'll be working on in the coming years are, one, establishing and supporting more formalized landscape and jurisdictional initiatives to enable better coordination and progress towards shared goals and shared landscapes. And two, figuring out the frameworks and incentives that encourage shared and collective impact, which is a role I'm hoping that BBCM might be able to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, and I know there's also work being done more on, on the sort of scope-free side on, on, uh, on that from SPTI, for example, and I think there, there's gonna happen more development in and, and this space. Uh, so thanks for, for, for sharing that, it's uh, super interesting. Um, so we will maybe get back to that with uh, questions from the audience as well. Uh, I want to go to Tsusala and um, you um doing a lot of things. You do 
funding the this climate transformation fund being the core donor to that one starting it but also a lot of uh, nature and biodiversity work outside of that and yeah, maybe you can tell us a bit more about that but also what it's led to because i know you you've seen quite some um, positive effects from it yeah thank you so much uh, thanks for having me for everyone who doesn't know Klan is a global payments network and shopping assistant we help consumers to easily find um, products to shop and, and smoothly pay for them and our climate strategy has been on a journey for more than three years now and it's been quite an exciting journey that really validated our approach to go beyond our value chain um, emissions and really focus on impacts that go beyond our business, not only when it comes to carbon emissions, but in general, just being a company that ha had a lot, has a lot of leverage over 150 million consumers, half a million merchants across the globe, there is an opportunity to think about sustainability, not only within your operations, but actually outside of your operations. So as you, um, as you were referring to earlier, uh, Robert, we set up a carbon tax that helped us not only, you know, amount for good amounts to support a diverse group of organizations within the Climate Transformation Fund, but it also has helped us gain better understanding internally of what our emissions look like and what they actually cost through the internal carbon tax. Um, I think over the last three years, we amounted for more than $5 million that we have spent on, on in initiatives within the Climate Transformation Fund. But we've been also able to continuously reduce our carbon emissions over time. So just 2022 to 2023, we had an absolute reduction of 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And that obviously is also part of this journey where people understand what are the emissions, where do they come from, and how can we steer or use an internal carbon tax steer towards emission reduction. So I think that's also an important aspect of it to come up with a pricing mechanism that actually works for a company to help steer um, emission redu reductions and not just only focus on um, only focus on um, beyond value chain um, um, projects to support. Overall, um, you know, our vision or motivation behind this is obviously, as you were referring to the carbon gap report, we are a low emitting company, so we have a huge ability to pay uh, for projects outside of our value chain because the mitigation within our value chain is quite easy to approach. So when we realized that, we really wanted to make sure that our approach ties into a world that gets to net zero and not just our company to be net zero and to try and claim for that. And I think especially looking at green claims policies, especially in, the Euro in Europe, there is a lot of momentum around going away from this claims-based approach, but really focusing on where can I as company achieve the biggest impact that contributes to a world that is at net zero and not just my company. Last thing you were speaking or you were asking about some of the impacts uh, that you were seeing. Um, obviously, we've been focusing a lot on nature contributions, not only on climate uh, contributions. What is important, I think, in, in the bigger scheme of all of things is to find the nexus between human development, climate and biodiversity and everything that you do as a business. And that's definitely also something that we will see from regulators going forward. But we've been able to onboard our consumers to join our journey and have them be part of the Climate Transformation Fund and support the exact same projects that we are supporting. Um, not by telling them, you know, if you support this project, your purchase is going to be climate neutral. That's wrong. But allowing them to take a default to action when they understand that every purchase actually comes with an impact. And that's been something that we've been rewarded by, um, by our consumers. We've been um, recognized as a thought leader in the space um, in many different institutions and it's been a really good journey so far so we're looking together with Milky Way to actually try and come up with a similar approach when it comes to when it comes to nature and try to you know find a systems approach and, and how companies can make meaningful contributions that go beyond the value chain mitigation. Perfect. Maybe one last thought, sorry. One last thought. I think currently, when we look at, you know, the increasing regulatory, um, you know, requirements for companies, a lot of these, you know, beyond value chain mitigation um, actions and activities, they're not being reflected in some of the policies we're seeing. So I would wish for support for those to also be embedded in some of the larger policy frameworks going forward for companies to also be, you know, able to, to report on those, not just voluntarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Um, thanks for for sharing a lot. Um, and then we will move to our, our last panelist, Jacob at Volkswagen Climate Partner. And um, so maybe you, you want to start talk, tell, telling us a little bit about the, the setup and what kind of company uh, you are. And you have been purchasing quite a lot of traditional carbon credits over the years. Um, it's very interesting to hear how you are sort of adjusting to, to the new reality and the beyond value chain mitigation framework. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. It's really, really interesting conversation so far. Um, yeah, I think it's it's kind of interesting to see. I mean, so many organizations are dealing with the same issues, uh, putting in place long term commitments, strategies, uh, while best practice is essentially evolving in real time. So, um, yeah, really interesting to hear the different perspectives. So, I guess, yeah, from our side, officially, uh, on behalf of Volkswagen Climate Partner, the Volkswagen Group, I mean, we're we're still kind of thinking through what our approach to the B BBCM framework is. Um, it's still rather new for us, I would say, um, but unofficially we can see shifts uh, along several tracks that are being pursued kind of at different speeds, if you want to put it like this. Um, on the one hand, we have calls for sourcing high quality credits that align with the net zero pathway. Uh, and in fact, the founding of Volkswagen Climate Partner as a kind of separate or new entity within the Volkswagen Group uh, was very much a part of that. Um, this was really all about moving from bulk buying of existing low cost credits on a ton for ton basis towards really making new investments in brand new projects, securing supply, uh, while also thinking more critically about what quality means to us, drawing on emerging best practice, um, but then also charting our own way in terms of where we see standards and frameworks, uh, for example, falling short um, or areas where we think that the auto industry in particular is capable of making uh, unique contributions. And then shifting our portfolio over medium to long term time horizons, kind of advising on that, how exactly that would work. Um, and this might mean focusing on key nature based solutions and techno technical solutions, uh, such as methane abatement uh, and transport electrification in the short term, um, while also moving and mixing slowly more and more um, removals credits, technical removals, innovation, innovative solutions, and kind of not off the shelf solutions, but a kind of general initiatives and so on in various markets where we operate um, over time. Um, and I think the strategy fits actually quite well already with the BVCM framework, at least from a procurement perspective in terms of how budgets are supposed to be used. Um, and I think it gets away from the idea of thinking about projects purely in tonnage terms, although we still use that as a metric in, in some cases. Um, but it also incorporates the idea of planting many seeds that could bear fruit uh, over time and contribute to the green transition in other ways that wouldn't just be on the ton for ton approach. So I think from that perspective, using um, the idea of one budget to achieve multiple objectives is actually very present in what we do already. Uh, so that transition isn't entirely foreign to us, I would say. Um, but where we do face challenges would be particularly in the claims, communication and um, funding tracks, um, which is is a new kind of innovation I think introduced here. And I know this is still, these are all hotly contested within the voluntary carbon market. So I, I won't really go into that debate. I think there are many people who can speak to that better than I can. Um, but I think internally there is a recognition that um, the old compensation claims model has reputational and legal risks that don't quite work anymore. Um, but fully agreeing on what a new approach looks like among all depart departments in very large organizations uh, such as ours, um, and particularly how to fund that. I mean, I, I think that's, still very much a work in progress and I expect to see more clarity here emerge over time and I would say that the BBCM approach could help provide some guidance here so that we'll be watching it closely and especially the early movers that we've been uh, hearing from uh, today um, but I think at this stage the crucial challenge from a use case or business case perspective is simply keeping decision makers interested um, in continuing continuing to make significant investments uh, into BBCM um, when as we know new projects uh, require some degrees of certainty and long term thinking on the one side, uh, but then we have all this policy uncertainty on the other. I mean, um, here um, the use case is essentially evolving while we put these investments into place. So that's 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 a huge challenge, I would say, particularly for large organizations, those that that have high higher emissions uh, than many other sectors um, would have. And getting a CFO to sign off on projects like this in this environment, it's it's really not easy. So I would say engagement and having a business case is very important. It's very critical to kind of keeping the conversation going while we figure a lot of this out. And it's just about managing very slow political and project implementation timelines against much faster annual budget and board meeting decisions. So 
that that's mm. that's a big challenge as I see it. Um, but what I think what I do appreciate internally for us as well in the operations that we have, and from our standpoint, is that we still have a strong commitment to invest in projects that take responsibility for ongoing emissions, uh, even if the how and the why need more time to fully flesh out. So yeah, I would leave it there. Great, yeah, those are some some great insights as well. But thanks so much for sharing. Um, we we have to move on to to Q and A from the audience so we can get some some of those squeezed in. Um, uh, so I think let, let's just start with some of the the questions on on what you brought up, Stephen. Uh, th there's interest from from the audience on funding things that are not exactly outside your value chain, but still not really attri attributable to your your own emissions. So uh, maybe. Tell us a little bit more what that could be, Stephen, and then maybe, maybe someone else. Um, maybe we have Scarlett and Leah now with us as well. Someone else want to chime in as well. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'll put a link to the white paper that we published with SustainCert on this topic uh, in the chat after this. But um, you know, one of the programs that we support, for example, is a public-private partnership where we and other companies, along with the U.S. Department of Agriculture are supporting locally led regenerative agriculture initiatives and investing in their staffing and technical assistance capacity, which is one of the key bottlenecks to widespread adoption. And so those locally led and capacity building investments just aren't really suited to attribution to individual companies. You know, capacity building has really indirect effects um, that are really hard to track the exact climate impacts of. Um, and locally led, you know, local kind of community-based organizations just don't have the you know, time, staffing capacity, or tools to collect huge amounts of data from farmers that are really needed to um, meet these kinds of requirements for actually claiming carbon impacts within the inventory. Um, and so I think that's, that's going to be a continued challenge to, to really unlock those, those sorts of claimable value chain abatement, even though those kinds of initiatives are really, really important to support. Um, and just also understanding kind of the political environment that we're, we're operating in, not, not from a macro sense, but more so from like working with farmers in these places, the programs that really resonate with farmers, at least within our North American supply chains, they're not carbon focused. They're, you know, soil health focused programming at, you know, at a soil and water conservation district. And if we were to impose a lot of kind of data requirements based on understanding the carbon impacts of these practices that we know have carbon impacts, but to like the level of rigor we need to claim, it would turn farmers off and just reduce the overall effectiveness of the programs. And so those are sort of these constant tensions that we have to resolve is the need to make meaningful impact on the ground and engage farmers and this kind of perceived need for sole kind of attribution of that impact. Um, so th that's sort of the gap that, that, that I see. Yeah, no, that, uh, super good. Thanks, thanks for elaborating on that. Um, we're going to share a little bit on, on this. Owen, uh, feel free to uh, to jump in as well and pick up questions from um, uh, yeah. from from the audience. Yeah, thanks, Robert. And thanks to to all our, our guests from the companies that spoke in that panel. And I think I, I mean, one thing that occurs, and maybe to to um, direct a question to Scarlett and to Leah, is that we heard just to take two examples. There, we had Beggars Group. Um, and the Murmur Fund speaking about how to leverage the creativity and uh, what art is great at. And then, you know, just as Steve was closing there, you know, what does flag need to do might look different again. And so there is a world, I think, in which you could have a generic approach. I will fund things that occur to me. But I think more and more what we're seeing from this conversation is, is a freeing up of organizations to leverage this concept and related concept in a way that is what they're good at and what their sector needs. And so um, maybe to Scarlett first, I, I just wondered, did that come through at all in your research? And, and then to both Scarlett and Leah, maybe a really tricky question. So we've heard from finance, uh, the arts, tech, um, transport um, uh, sectors just now at FLAG. What do we, how do we approach more challenging in quotation mark sectors the the hard to abate sectors to, to use an ugly term how do we think about this in in sectors like oil and gas where people balk at the idea of that group for example engaging in things like carbon markets when they're not really able currently to set net zero targets so um, maybe just scarlet first just anything any insights you had um, in terms of 
um, sectoral or sector-led thinking that integrates well with some of the guidance that you guys have produced at SBTI? Um, and then any thoughts on a really tricky question on how, how you deal with hard-to-abate sectors um, and their BVCM? Yeah, sure. So we interviewed a bunch of companies. We did a survey to ask them about, you know, what they were already doing, what they thought the business case might be. And it was very clear that the business case looked really different depending on the sector. The food and ag company said, you know, we want to we need to do this anyway because of soil health, because we can't just invest in that single farmer that we happen to be sourcing from that year. We want to invest into the landscapes to ensure security of supply, to address water and nature issues. But they were kind of frustrated maybe that that always wouldn't that wouldn't always appear in their kind of value chain targets. So I think clearly some of this is an accounting question. Um, and obviously the greenhouse gas protocol, land sector and removal guidance has been, you know, working very hard to try and address some of those issues. And that should be finalized later this year. Um, but I think also climate has, doesn't have to be the thing that we tag everything to in a way. Um, maybe I'm not articulating that clearly, but I guess what I mean is that um, I also wear another hat. I work on the Science Based Target Network, which develops nature um, methodologies for companies. And those targets there are much more targeted at the landscape level um, because nature operates at that level much more. Um, and so I think the opportunity to kind of tie together, a, a, you know, a company's in value chain flag targets with their nature landscape targets and their BBCM activities, it will drive much more kind of holistic action on climate and nature. It's not always the case that something that is good for climate is good for nature. Typically, if it's good for nature, it'll be good for climate. And so we, we want companies to develop climate strategies that also deliver on that. Um, I also think the you know we we really emphasize in the report that we talk a lot about the business case and that's the first step in dis defining what your pledge is um because you know clearly it's going to look different um and we also highlight that it needs to be integrated into the company's transition plan a company cannot decarbonize in isolation you cannot just invest directly to your supplier it does create complicated accounting things where like, OK, imagine I invest in R&D, you know, green hydrogen today. It's not really going to hit my value chain for five, ten years, but it will eventually. How do we kind of dis disentang disentangle the what's in value chain and what's beyond value chain? And I think in the guidance we say, look, we're talking about being in spirit of above and beyond and not tr getting too caught up in some of these like accounting technicalities. Um, and I think that's really kind of how companies need to approach this. This is just part of being a holistic transition plan. The hard to debate question. Thanks, Owen. This is a good one. Um, I mean, you know, the most important thing that the hard to debate sectors can do is abate their own sector. And whilst they have, in many cases, the biggest responsibility for climate change based on historic emissions, they also have a very expensive journey ahead of them. And that is, you know, really the most important thing that we need them to focus on. So I'm not personally expecting that we're going to see huge investments by um, harder to abate sectors in the near term into beyond value chain mitigation. What we might see is them investing heavily into the scale up of carbon dioxide removals because those sectors are going to have a greater share of residual emissions at the end. So again, I think their BVCM is very much going to be aligned with like th their transition. Um, and maybe if they can't make an investment today, um, you know, if green hydrogen isn't going to help them abate in the next five years, it might in the next 10 years. And so that their BVCM will be more kind of in that vein. vein. Um, yeah, so I hope that's answered the question. Um, and ultimately, it's going to look a bit different for everyone. And, and I think that's a good thing. Let many flowers bloom. Yeah, thank, thanks, Scarlett. And, and maybe, Leah, just to, before we, we wrap up, um, and you know, not an easy question to answer in a very short space of time, but I, I, something Scarlett just mentioned, I think, I think is really interesting, and, and, and Robert and his panel mentioned it as well. We have clearly, amongst the three organisations that set out guidance and reports in this in this call, spoken in, a, in quite a high-minded way about what's necessary, like how, you know, what's really necessary. How do we overcome kind of the cognitive dissonance of, you know, buying cheap credits hist historically versus the real cost of continuing 
willing to admit. And it's important to present the high-minded, high-principled case for everything. But clearly, companies are going to need to ramp up efforts. They're going to, they, you know, starting with 250 euro social cost of carbon internal fees is very difficult for a lot of companies. And, you know, a lot of companies are still figuring out what they, they need to do. And there's, a, there's clearly a lot of concern around about being criticised, I think, for not fulfilling everything, um, you know, and trying to get to that place. So I just wondered, how is WWF, how are you thinking about that? How do we encourage people in, hold the high line, mitigate the worst of the criticism, but manage the best of it? How do we kind of strike a balance as companies ramp up their efforts, do you think? Thank you for that question. And I think it comes back to a few things that, that were just mentioned by Scott as well. And several times in the interesting discussion of the corporate panel within the corporate panel as well, um, that I, I would I would also see this all of these guidance and, um, and building blocks as a new way of framing things in a way, right? And they, they that cannot necessarily already answer all accounting, pricing. Um, do those are elements that we need to start responding along the way to ensure robustness and to provide guidance um, to to help companies to navigate to already be on the, the safe side of criticism and so on. However, what we really, as always, um, this is voluntary, as, as it has been said, and as it's, of course, clear. So um, this needs to be filled with life, which is sector specific, and it can also be filled with company and sector specific strategic objectives, right, as we've now heard in several sector specific examples. And I think that is really important. And the same thing can kind of be translated into the question of a flexibility or in terms of, a, a let's say, a gradual implementation in terms of the price, right? So, and come the same thing maybe also when we started, um, so I used to work in the Science-Based Targets Initiative when we developed the Net Zero Standard. And when we first started to work on that, we were like, okay, um, how can we get companies to commit to a, um, a North Star? Because that is the, what is necessary, right? Because this is also the scientific, but also moral duty. And then filling this up with life and uh, sector specific real life steps and investments. And I think the same applies here. So getting started is important and having the necessary endpoint in mind. And of course, that should be then the social cost of carbon. Does that mean that every company is able to do that this year with right. huge scope free? No, right. And we would also absolutely at WWF pragmatically um, uh, acknowledge that and, and work with company to find a suitable and equitable starting point and define a smart and um, yeah and robust long term vision of, yeah. of where to go to. Yeah. Th thanks, Leah. I, I, I mean, I, I totally echo that. And I think uh, uh, kind of measured and transparent and honest reflection on on you know where we are and not overstating in our claims I think is is critical on that journey and I just wanted to wrap well firstly by saying thanks to to Scarlett and to Leah and to all our company panelists and a big thanks to, to Robert as well as as kind of co-chair of this panel and, and all the folks behind the scenes that have made it work just to wrap um, to say you can find our guidance um, on the gold standard website and you can contact myself and my colleague Dan McGrath our email addresses are there I do recommend you check out SBTI's publications on BBCM in the last month and um, all of WWF's publications now and forthcoming and um, that paper that Steve mentioned as well we'll make sure all of those are um, released via our LinkedIn page as links um, in the wrap up to the webinar. I just wanted to draw attention to one last thing, which is to say we are going to be launching an exploratory working group on how to implement BBCM. So interested in company participants, consultants, NGOs, academics, and um, we are going to be creating topical working groups to try and unpack some of the complexity because there is much more work needed. I think now we have a solid foundation to build off, um, but a foundation isn't a building. We need to to get to work on adding all of the, the life um, into the, the piece that Leah just mentioned as well. So with that, thanks to everybody that participated. Thank all of you for joining a, a really excellent panel. I really enjoyed uh, listening to all of the interventions and um, look out for uh, on, on our LinkedIn page for the um, output that you can um, follow up with. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.